so um, let's get started. So my name is Lauren Farrell, and I'm going to help facilitate us this evening. Um, I am one of the Montpelier City Councilors, um, but I'm not here with any agenda. I'm just helping run the meeting, collect and listen to ideas. Um, Carl Attenmeyer has kindly offered to scribe for us, so he's going to be taking notes. So we're going to capture all the ideas that come out. We are looking, as Paul said, to leave this room um, in a little over an hour with a handful of priorities. We have a massive topic, so if you know there's more than the one to three things that we absolutely need to share with a big group, that's okay. But we're looking to narrow down to like two to three big things. It would be great if those could be, for example, something that we could act on quickly as a community, something that we could see really taking action on. Um, and maybe something longer term. Uh, just ideally, it's not like two things that are going to take 10 years to, to act on, for example. Like some things that we can really kind of dig right into. Um, but you know, we'll see where the conversation goes. Uh, we do have some um, climate policy experts in the room um, who work in a range. Uh, Paul Burns from VPIRG does lots of climate policy. Jared Duval, Energy Action Network, Johan Miller, Vermont Natural Resources Council, uh, Kate Stevenson, who uh, does all kinds of like green building. I don't know your official title, but it's like a major expert in all kinds of climate things <laughs> and has been part of the Mopular Energy Advisory Committee for countless years. Chris Lumber from the city is our sustainability, so and recognize lots of you who also have your own expertise. So we have like amazing resources in this room. Uh, so I think. Uh, can help keep us focused. Um, the rundown for what we're going to do, um, we're going to spend the first 15 minutes or so uh, talking about what's going on right now, some lay of the land, so people can share things that are in the works on climate action, things that we know about, so we can get kind of the landscape of what's already happening so that that can ground us. And then we're going to be looking at um, your ideas for what could or should be done for either shorter term recovery or longer term resilience. And Carl's going to kind of capture them under one of those buckets um, so that we can, again, make sure we're kind of keeping an eye on both of those. So we're being responsive to immediate needs, but also uh, looking at resilience. And then we're going to spend the last 15 minutes um, as a group coming out with what are those handful of ideas that we want to share with the bigger group as priorities that we're excited for the community to work on together. And then we'll go back to the house floor. So let's start out. Um, so if people could just share and just try to, I guess, talk loudly because we don't have a microphone or anything. Um, and just share uh, what what do you know is happening now that relates to you know this idea. So again, our topic is described as action in the face of climate change. Um, and that was described as actions residents, businesses, property owners can take to reduce carbon impacts and address climate change, uh, you know, changes in lifestyle purchasing power or energy use to help address climate change. What can we do as a community, as a city, as a state? So that was what we're grounding ourselves in. Yes? I'll start. I, um, I've been doing a little research on carbon footprint, kind of. There's, a lot of carbon footprint calculators on the internet. And I I don't think I've found one that is like seems like really includes everything and I feel really good about it. So um, I was hoping that with some expertise in this room maybe there is one that is the best because I've been thinking like um, I really want to know my carbon footprint, and I really don't, I really personally feel like I need to make some changes so this won't, won't happen to Montpelier. And I think the more good data we get out there, the more people that do their carbon footprint, the more people that know, hey, if I don't take this flight, hey, if I do this, hey, if I do this, that then with that data, I mean, we can start like a whole thing in Montpelier. You know, I think of those like charts if we're raising money, you know, how it kind of goes up. But if we had some kind of calculation like this is our carbon footprint in Montpelier right now of whatever zillion tons of carbon it is, and then we're working our way down by people pledging or something based on a carbon footprint calculator that we're all using. 
I think we could really get some interest in the community and people taking kind of an individual responsibility for that. And I would really, you know, kind of like to work on that end of it. Cool. Great. <clears throat> My name's Kirk Let me back up for a second to where we are. Um, we're dealing in the, this is the most important issue. If we don't find a way to resolve the question of how to stop climate change and to deal with the impact, you're driving climate change. Nothing else that anybody else is going to do will make any damn difference. Because we're, we're going to be overwhelmed by the problems. So the question is, where are we? But where we are right now is that we all believe it's a problem. Except the people in charge of things are buying the current line that the GOP and our conservatives are running, which is, yeah, we've decided it is a problem, but it's not a serious problem. It is a terribly, terribly serious problem. And we have to be aware of how serious it is to begin to drive that issue into people's minds. What we miss mostly when we think about this problem is the huge number of positive feedbacks that are built into it. What we miss is the fact that, for instance, one of the most, the most important climate, uh, climate change driving gas is not carbon dioxide, it's water vapor. Half of, it, it's half of the climate change is from water here. How does it get there? Because we put carbon dioxide in the air, we run the air up, that warms up the ocean water, warms up the atmosphere, there's more atmospheric moisture, then where atmospheric moisture is greenhouse gas, so it warms the planet up, and around and up, around and around and around and around. Same thing, same problem with hydrogen dioxide. Same problem with, with methane. Methane has a whole bunch of positive feedbacks on it, so it's very powerful. Nobody really is talking about how important this problem is, what's actually driving it. So where do we go? I believe Montpelier is in a position in the national spotlight, and I believe that we are well enough informed of what's going on that we could create a national model, maybe a global model, on how to react to this kind of a problem, to this problem specifically, how to drive down climate change. There are a bunch of things we can do, we can talk about it later, but I want to set that model as we can do something here that's important. Thank you. Any other framing contests? Um, yeah, from my perspective, as much as this is a terrible thing, it also leaves us in something of an opportunity um, to rebuild in a greener way. And I, I'm a climate activist with the Vermont Youth Lobby, so I have some experience in community organizing, but I don't know a ton about climate technology, and smarter people than me can talk about how to rebuild in a climate-friendly way. Um, and I just want to present that as a question, because I think that's one of the most important issues we can address in this room, is about building back our infrastructure in this city in a greener way. Um, and I want to present that and ask all the very qualified people in this room if any of you have ideas about Thank you. Raise your hand, Dave. Um, Dave Graham, I've lived in the area since 1985, um, moved from Plainfield into Montpelier in 1992 after reading Bill McGibbons the end of nature and decided I didn't want to drive back and forth anymore. I uh, had this crazy idea that Montpelier might want to make a plan where we try to move the central business district up hills and around the area of the college and set up some kind of either air or tram or frequent shuttle service back and forth between there and downtown. Whatever buildings downtown can actually be torn down and turned into riverine forest and parkland, ideal. It, it would be much better absorbing the flood waters that are going to be coming more and more frequently in the future. And uh, I know it's a crazy idea, but to me the crazier idea is actually doing the same thing over again and expecting a different result. And that sort of definition is crazy. So, uh, I, I think we can start this in a trickle and then try to actually develop some sort of a migration, but, you know, change the zoning up by the college to encourage commercial development, number one. Number two, when, when businesses downtown start talking about, uh, you know, no Glenn Sturgis at the Capital Coffee Shop has already said he's not going to reopen, well, hey, Glenn, or hey, your successors, what about opening up at the college next to this new thing that's going in there called the Greenway Institute for Sustainable Engineering. Now to me, sustainable engineering, they gotta love it because what's more sustainable engineering than moving downtown a hill, right? It seems like there's a lot of synergy here. You know, put a coffee shop next to an academic institution, how really convenient to them, and, 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 the, and the business has a great new customer. 
and so on and so forth. I mean, I, I just think I just think that we need to come up with sort sort of a a, a solid short-term and long-term plans that are integrated, connected, and uh, uh, the, you know the short-term plan would be zoning changes to encourage commercial development up there. The long-term plan, and obviously the short-term plan would have to include talking to Greenway Institute about is there any room up there now? Are you know are, are there possibilities for some of our small businesses moving up there now? Obviously, we're going to need transportation back and forth, public transportation, and, and you know, I think. Personally, I don't know whether the money would ever be available, but I think something like an aerial train would be really cool, or just you know the small shuttle buses back and forth so that people who are downtown can still get off the hill and go to these other businesses. You know, let's encourage you know some of these. I, I drive I drive through downtown most most days and I look around and I go, we're a month out and it's still looking like a ghost town, and I you know I just sent, have this horrible sense of discouragement. And if we developed a plan and said, you know. Climate change avoidance is great, but we also have to have to do mitigation, resilience, planning for the fact that it's kind of already here, and that's what's going to give us everybody's forecasting more more frequent floods. So I'm starting to repeat myself. So I'm <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> oh well, this is um, whatever. I'm looking at one of the groups, the Riverine Quarter, but I just see our town. I live whatever right on the north branch and all the hills going down, the water was coming down like a river on the streets. And I think we can do a lot to try and um, whatever, get people to get rid of their lawns and plant things that are just way better at soaking up the rain. And there's opportunities on the entire um, watershed to absorb the water better than what we have now. Because you know, obviously these big rain events are gonna be whatever our future, but we can, there's a lot we can do to reduce the water going into the river. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm Nancy Scholes, and um, I'm currently serving on the city's Complete Streets Committee, which works, um, advocates for bike ped concerns. And previous to my involvement with Complete Streets, I was the director of the Vermont Bicycle and Pedestrian Coalition for about nine years. So I speak as a bike ped advocate. And when you mentioned that one of the things we would be talking about are quick, immediate, inexpensive fixes or you know improvements, um, paint is a cheap, immediate help. And we'll get more people biking in Montpelier. And over the years I've worked in advocacy, the number one thing people tell me is, well, I bike, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the cars. And so if we could, um, um, as a perfect example, the intersection of State and Main, if you're biking along Main Street toward Shaw's and you come to that intersection, you have a choice of, um, if you want to go straight, you don't really want to get in the right turn lane. If you get in the go straight lane behind the cars, you get you know several lungs full of fumes and, and you might not even make it before the light changes. So what I typically do, and, and it's uh, perfectly legal, is um, go up between the cars that are turning and the cars that want to go straight and position myself slightly ahead of the car that wants to go straight so I'm out of the way with, of everyone. But there's a, um, a simple uh, thing that would make most people feel much more comfortable, which is painting that area that I'm describing green. It's a green box that is understood as a safe place for cyclists to be. And we did have a, a little bit of green on Bailey Avenue for a while. <laughs> kind of wears off, it doesn't get replaced. You know, fog lines, the white stripe on the road makes us feel like we have a place to be. It's not always, you know, smooth and free of debris and broken pavement, but um, striping and creating those green boxes um, with paint, just a super fast thing that could be done that would give people more confidence to ride. Great. All right, so we're transitioning already, and this is the perfect time, so well done, everyone, um, into the ideas for short-term, um, short you know, how are we helping our community recover in climate-smart ways, um, and also longer-term resilience um, measures that we can take as a community. And we've already captured some good ones. So for you, and then Paul. Joseph Gaines from Marshfield. Um, I think something that's very easy to do, but I think very important, is to change the language. Stop talking about it as climate change that does not elicit the sense of urgency that the actual facts 
require. So I think that when we start using language that's a little different, and I'm old enough to remember the early women's movement when they talked about the need for changing language, we change the way people think. I think that's what we should be starting to do. That's cheap and quick. Thank you. What's the, what's the, what's the proposal? Language. Crisis? Or what's the language well, I would not call it climate change. I would call it climate degradation, climate breakdown, something that speaks to the urgency of the times. Change is yeah. innocuous. <laughs> Paul and then you. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where this fits. Uh, there's a lot of um, bleeding over, I think, in the different issues. But uh, again, Paul Burns would be her. Um, uh, I kind of think that this problem that we face, we're talking about action in the face of climate change, I don't think anything significant is going to happen to, to really change the trajectory that we are on until the fossil fuel industry is made uh, to uh, made responsible, held responsible, made accountable uh, for the damage that they have caused here. And let's, you all know what has happened since the Montpelier flood. You know, if you look at Maui, and you look at California, and you look at the South, and on and on. Uh, we could be an example, I think, for others, if we decided it is time to hold the industry that caused this problem accountable. And as you said at the beginning, we should take stock of what's already in the works. I do want to uh, note that uh, Senator Ann Watson from Washington County, obviously former mayor of Montpelier, has agreed to be the chief sponsor of legislation uh, that we are dubbing Make Big Oil Pay uh, to hold the fossil fuel industry accountable for the damages that they have caused here. Something on the order of $100 million a year for 25 years. That's not going to cover all the damages that have caused. $2.5 billion from the industry for Vermont would be a nice start um, to begin to hold them accountable. Those numbers could change and all the rest, but I do want to mention that Senator Watson is doing this. I would expect other members of the Washington County and uh, Montpelier delegation and many others, particularly those representing areas that have been so harmed uh, this summer, to step up and be part of that effort too. So I just wanted to know. Yeah, could like as we, if people are identifying the kind of more state or federal, could you just share your perspective on what like the Montpelier community could do to support that? So that as we think about what we're prioritizing, it's, it's the role that we can play to help advance that. I do think big issues uh, uh, of change are often moved uh, more by uh, a sense of shared values and passion and stories and righteousness uh, than they are uh, very technical uh, arguments that some of us like to make. But I think this, if we are ever going to hold this industry accountable in Vermont, I, I think this coming legislative session that reconvenes in January in rooms just like this that's going to be the time to do it when we have the people of this community step forward, talking to your legislators, your, your, your reps, your senators, and similar conversations taking place around the state. You might have a chance of convincing legislators who might not otherwise typically be on the leading edge of a campaign to hold the, the world's most wealthy corporations responsible. I mean, none of this is going to be easy. Uh, I recognize that. But if they're ever going to do it, it would be because you all urge or demand that they do so. Do you believe election be faster? It has not been uh, so far. I'd be happy to talk to you about that. I'm happy that the children, uh, the young people in Montana just won a, a, a victory there as they step in that process. Uh, but uh, I actually, we, we need it all. Uh, we need it all. My name is <clears throat> Brian Powell. I live on Lower Northfield Street. We've destabilized the climate. We will have more floods. Um, I, I fear that it's irretrievable. All we have here is that we can solve the problem. Well, we're not going to. But pretending that we will, and I prefer to act in a positive way, though I think we're doomed. Um, I try to be conscious of my carbon footprint. I'm forced to drive a car. There are certain things that I just, I'm forced to drive a car. I'm not forced to force dry my clothing. I'm not forced to use a clothes dryer, a planet-killing piece of crap. 
But do we, I mean, is there anybody in this room that does not own a clothes dryer? Bless you! Bless you! Oh my God, we are among the saints. I am so self-righteous that I'm wearing nothing that has been forced dry. <laughs> I agree that we in Montpelier could get something going and we in Montpelier could be visible. I think we could, we should organize to tell people to kill their dryers. <laughs> Your clothes will dry by themselves. It's happened since there have been textiles. <laughs> now, I know that there are people who live in small apartments for whom this would be, people who don't have deep sinks, you know, our, our, our infrastructure it, it is, is not in favor of that. But you, you can do it. I have a clothesline on my front porch. I have a wood stove. In the winter, I put my grandmother's old drying rack in front of the wood stove. And my clothes are dried in a jiffy. That's All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got this idea. I want to keep, keep moving, but it's on the list. And anyway, kill the dryers. Kill the clothes dryers. And it could fit under the carbon footprint. Right. Yeah. All right. What else? Um, I think that like a lot of people have mentioned that Montpelier and all of Vermont could definitely be like a role model for the rest of the world or America. Um, and I think that's because, especially in Montpelier, the community, like a big majority of people, are already really careful about their carbon footprint and um, really good about it. And I think that it's not about changing other people at this point, it's about changing ourselves. And if everyone works on that, even just in a small place, I think it can really affect the rest of the nation or the world. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this fits in the quick fix category. I'm not sure where. Well, we can do either long term or short term. Yeah. We're just trying to categorize them. All right, wonderful scribe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but something I've been working on for the, about the past year is to get my high school to become, to go net zero. The school board, which I now serve on, is working on it, and it's taken a lot of work, but um, one thing that we can work on as a city is making all our city and municipal buildings net zero. Of course, the dream would be to have all our buildings in town net zero, but one step at a time. That's awesome. Kate, I don't know if you want to talk about oh, what the city has done oh, with Chris Adam, but just oh, a quick context. Right, well, we, you know, obviously, um, and Chris is here from the city, we're many years into making all the city buildings net zero and are about 50% there. Um, my idea for, my big idea, if, if money was no object. Dream big. Dream big. Dream big. Dream big. Is, to figure out how all the how the city could support all the buildings that were flooded, moving their mechanical systems out of the flood zone and not being fossil fuel systems, so that whatever goes into replace is electric. Um, and it's a it's a big project. And it's not the sort of thing that each homeowner or business owner need, should be figuring out right. on their own. And it would need a really concerted effort to um, go building by building and help design and you know, find the team that can do the work, potentially filling in basements um, like they did in the Waterbury State Complex, um, and really you know, just you know, making a, a longer term uh, change there. Assuming that, that the downtown is still downtown and that some of these buildings that are flooded are still gonna be there down the road. So that's my big idea. Um, so my name's Jerry Duval. Um, I work for Energy Action Network where I do, we do a lot of research analysis and tracking on energy and climate issues. Um, and I also live on um, Elm Street. Um, and just from a context perspective, I thought I would share, like, following up on, I'm sorry, I don't Tim. know, Tim's first comment, it's, it's a phenomenally complex 
area. You know, there are different methodologies for how uh, um, emissions are measured uh, from a life cycle basis to a kind of point of combustion basis. But I think that in a big picture, if you look statewide for Vermont, and I think Montpelier is likely uh, very similar, um, nearly three quarters of the climate pollution that is produced comes from our use of fossil fuels for how we get around, uh, primarily driving single passenger vehicles, and it's the fossil fuel use we use to heat homes and buildings. Uh, primarily oil and propane boilers and furnaces. So nearly three quarters, like if we're talking about doing our part, the biggest part of the problem, the most low hanging fruit is the fossil fuels that are used for, for uh, how we get around and how we heat our homes and buildings. And so related to that, um, one of the questions I have, which relates to something Kate said, is I think one of the challenges that we're seeing downtown right now is for folks who decide to rebuild, not having um, heating equipment, water heaters, um, et cetera, in basements that needing to be above grade, and also not wanting everybody to have to figure this out themselves. I wonder if in addition to some of like the, the custom building by building specific approaches, um, I wonder if this might be an opportunity, again, this is money not being as much of an object, I think it would need some federal support, but is this an opportunity to extend the district heating system? And there, one of the, there's two co-benefits of that. The more users, the more cost effective it becomes for everybody, but then also not every building needs to have its own heating plant. And it, they, they can just get heat in through a pipe and you don't have to worry about having a furnace or a boiler in your basement. Um, so I think that that's an idea that should be explored. I, I don't know the numbers on it. I don't know the engineering feasibility, the cost effectiveness, but I think it's a question worth asking because if we're serious about building back better, it needs to be building back without fossil fuel heating systems as much as possible. Can I ask you a follow up on that? I mean, do we already have it if, if, it, if so much is based on the transportation? Could, um, could you get me somewhere like, if, uh, if I bought a helmet at Onion River, if I walked down to Onion River and bought a helmet, bike helmet, versus having Amazon deliver a bike helmet to me, I mean, is, is there, could we put together like that kind of data to really support the localness of Montpelier trying to not only support businesses, but actually save mm -hmm. carbon in that? I mean, is, is that data out there? I mean, if, if I was interested in mining that, I mean, could you give me some stuff and I could try to figure all that out? Yeah, I, I think that there is a big difference between the kind of big picture level, like what are the statewide emissions and then um, versus like the personal carbon footprint calculator. And um, I know Kate's done some research on this as well in terms of personal footprint calculators. And I have the same issue with you. It's, it's difficult. All not great. Yeah, I mean, I almost <laughs> wonder if, though, there could be, you know, if we know that statewide and we presume in Montpelier our biggest emissions are going to be transportation and fossil heating. So you could do a campaign of, you know, buying local that, you know, that is saving the transportation of the thing, the goods that we're buying and also supports our downtown. Um, and, you know, I think you could come up with the kind of case studies even without the hard numbers, um, just knowing. So I think we could think about how do we capture, you know, our biggest uses of fossil fuels and the kinds of things we can do about it. I saw back there. I, I was just going to say, like, what about incentive, more incentives for electric cars? I mean, if we're all driving the wrong vehicles, we need to drive, or maybe like incentives for electric cars, like sharing one with your neighbor. Let's say you go in on it, and you can say you both work from home. Like I don't know. I'm just throwing that out. If it's yeah. like none of us should be driving gas gas, gas cars. It sounds like from what he said. Then if we none of us drove gas cars, it's not familiar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not really an idea. It's just like yeah, I know idea. there's some incentives, yeah. you know, but could there be local incentives? Yeah, you could do a city incentives. Could they like help us get electric? Yeah, like they do other things. They, you know? So there are yeah, both state and federal okay. tax incentives, and um, they just also announced that there's an additional one if you if your vehicle was damaged by flooding. 
they're adding to the EV incentive by an extra $1,000 or something. And could we maybe make more charging stations in Montpelier or something out to make it easier for everyone? I don't know. Yeah, it's just a thought. Yeah? I wanted to add, ask a follow-up on, kind of a combination follow-up on uh, Kate and Garrett's remarks because I think, Kate, did I hear you correctly and say you'd like to go to all electric like heat and probably heat pumps in, in downtown buildings, is that right? Mm -hmm. Or, or district heat potentially. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Or district heat if that is may, maybe an option in some buildings more than others. Right, and so but district heat obviously that's burning wood, I, and and so which is does have a carbon footprint and of some kind, and and um, obviously a different strategy than all, all electric. I've also had a question about the district heat, which is. Um, isn't most of the infrastructure underground? I mean, piping is all underground, and how, how flood resilient is that? It, it's flood resilient. It's uh, <clears throat> one issue that we did experience with district heat is um, some of the electronic controls, the heat meters, that type of thing, were installed in basements, and we lost quite a few of those. Um, and that's kind of a function of how the system is designed and. and how it works. So that, that was kind of an unfortunate setback. We're scrambling to <clears throat> order new heat meters and get the district heat system back online. Uh, to, to Jared's point, I will say that we've had more interest in new district heat connections since this event than, mm -hmm. than we have at all previously. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're in meetings and, and talks with specific building owners to hopefully get them connected. Uh, Anybody that anybody that's not kind of very close to a building that's already on district heat or already has piping in it, the idea of getting district heat pipes to the building and up and running in time for this heating season is yeah. it's a really, really tough lift. And it's and that's so the people are in the position of having to put in some kind of heating system to get in to get through this winter <coughs> when district heat's not, it's not instantaneous, right? right. So it's, that's kind of a tough pill to swallow. Mm -hmm. Is there a possible combination as in a district heat that's, instead of burning wood, it would be based on heat pumps? Or am I just completely going off? That, does that be a, a that different is, system? There's, yeah. uh, there are hot water geothermal systems that would, would be a, a complete change of the district heat system. There's, mm -hmm. uh, there's no easy, transition to, to different technologies for the district heat plant that I'm aware of. Hi, um, I'm Jolyn DeBurton. I um, live here and um, use as a uh, music education coordinator at Montsbury Music School. Um, so I have zero expertise in the climate and environmental science realm. Um, so part of my coming here was just trying to understand the bigger picture. I, did, I have no idea what's possible, what's affordable. It's, it's almost overwhelming. But what I do feel is a lot like what um, I love me. I love me? Yeah. Miriam. Sorry. I, I have not even on it. But what you said about organizing people and advocating, I feel like um, the climate crisis, or whatever better language that creates a better sense of urgency, what I'm really feeling is this is um, as much an education, uh, informational, and communications issue. I talk to people all the time who are incredibly smart and well educated and have great life experience who don't recycle, don't, you know, they're not in Vermont so they don't compost, but you know, like it's just, it's not connecting what we're experiencing and what our daily habits are for so many people. Maybe a fewer percentage of later, <laughs> maybe. But um, for me, that's like what gives me like this feeling of you know doom and existential despair. Is like there are not enough people who are freaking out. <laughs> we need more people to be freaking out. But then taking wise action. <laughs> <laughs> Models, uh, cities and, and towns and uh, places 
all over the world that are doing a better job at this than we are. And I'm just so curious, like in the interest of not reinventing the wheel, I'm sure you all probably know of them, but like, what can we just do that other cities are doing that's working? A lot of these ideas, I think, are uh, great and doable, but there must be so many more that we can bring the clip to us. I just wanted to say, like, what's amazing is I was an exchange student in Switzerland in 1983. See, this is why. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling you, literally, they took their own bags to the market down the street from, and this was in the city. Yeah. There was a big metal thing. You put your bottles in here, your cans in here. I mean, it was like it. They have been doing it in Europe. For, for so long, for something. Like, yes. And they have been hanging their clothes dry. Yeah. And everyone in the building gets one wash day. I mean, it's like, it's like, there are so many models and out there. Biking. And they have been mm. biking to yeah, school yeah. and no yeah. heading to school forever. And we are just so far behind and we've just been so unwilling to make changes in our lives because we're just babies. And um, but I, I but I think that I think that like if we just looked across the pond and found any old city <laughs> and said like what are they doing and they don't even package food they don't they they're just like it's just like a completely different culture and I think there are a lot of examples in places outside this country. Mm -hmm. Question? Yes. Does Montpelier have sister cities? Yeah, is there a formal sister city relationship? I hope so. There was some sort of They sent us some soccer. <laughs> 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 anyway, if you want to reach across the pond and pick a random city, if, there, if, there, if there's one that's so the only if they're leading on climate. What's yeah. <laughs> that? <laughs> only if they're leading on climate. I was gonna say they probably are because they're across the pond. Very European. I'll volunteer to go scout I'll volunteer to tour your arm on the I lead the Energy and Climate Program at the Vermont Natural Resources Council. Um, I'm on the Climate Council with Jared, but more, more so, I live um, on Redstone here in Montpelier. Love so many of these ideas. I guess I would say, too, that my theory of change is really about changing the policies so that we can make it easy and affordable or incentivize or require people to do the right thing. <laughs> I totally believe in individual change. I think the kill your dryer um, inspired, but I also think we need a policy framework that that drives the change at the scale and pace that we need. And thankfully, we actually have incentive programs like through the Inflation Reduction Act and through our partners at Efficiency Vermont, through our utilities who are, who are exploring how can we help customers rebuild and rewire with clean electricity instead of locking into fossil fuels. So one short-term idea, because I think it builds off a lot of really good ideas in this room, is because I do believe in the power of leadership and the power of models. I think one of you fabulous ladies said that. Um, is, is there potential to do some sort of resolution from the capital of declaring climate emergency? <laughs> I mean, I call it global weirding. It is a climate emergency. We actually have a law in the state of Vermont called the Global Warming Solutions Act that acknowledges that we're in a climate emergency and says we have to cut pollution yeah. in line with the science, and we are so far off it, um, largely because of heating and transportation. So I do wonder if symbolically we could, in the short term, you know, have a resolution that says and recognizes and talks about the need for declaring it a um, climate emergency. We can talk about. Um, these are being fossil fuel disasters. If you haven't read Jared's recent piece in Vermont Digger about stop calling these natural disasters, these are fossil fuel um, disasters. We can acknowledge we need to focus on transportation and heating. We should ask our legislative leaders in this body, including Allison, we have a lot of champs in the state legislature and in our congressional delegation who we can lean on to ask them to help maximize the incentives, that we should hold polluters accountable, that we should um, help people and businesses in Vermont in this moment access the funding or the solutions that they need. I think something that articulates that in the short term could be helpful for long term 
sort of policy progress and also just education, who said that? I think maybe that could be one short-term idea. Mm -hmm. And I think other cities and towns in the state of Vermont would be interested. Mm -hmm. yeah. Question? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So if, uh, if the legislature declares a state of climate emergency, then what special powers would the governor get? It would be an interesting question to explore, but if, if some city did that first, I actually think some other towns in Vermont have done this, mm -hmm. but, but in this moment, I don't know how many others, but in this moment with this particular capital city, like devastated by climate induced disaster, like it feels like a, a powerful statement and it could reflect a lot of the really good ideas that you all put forward and help us put pressure in the right places at the state level and the federal level. Just, I see a couple more hands. So we've got about five more minutes for ideas. Did just want a bucket. So if we do, when we get into prioritization, just noting um, the city does um, put together like a lobbying portfolio, like a package of priorities for the community. We could do potentially like a climate emergency and name some things that we want to advocate for as a city. I think the stories that we all have to come into this building and share of what mm -hmm. this, these fossil fuel disasters are doing to communities to build the urgency. So when we're, we're coming back out to the big group, you know, maybe there's a set of policy priorities, state policies that we want to as a community advocate for. Um, that could be under an umbrella of a climate emergency. Just trying to package some things up as we go through. Um, and also hearing a lot of ideas about um, kind of community engagement. We do have our energy advisory committee uh, that Kate and I and Chris uh, serve on and have an outreach team and stuff. So we could think, as we're thinking, we could think about how that group and maybe some of you want to join <laughs> um, could be doing, um, you know, I, I feel like there's kind of like public relations opportunities around education and like packaging up some of the things that are out there around incentives and if we're seeing gaps in incentives, maybe the city is doing more or that goes on our state policy um, agenda. But just hearing a lot of really exciting threads and I think there was Joseph and then you. Oh, okay. Well, clearly from what everybody is saying, this is a multi-layered issue and that's one of the reasons why we can't we haven't come as a nation together on it because there's so many impacts and they are delayed impacts and they, we do not see a direct, act, a direct effect of the things we do, negative and positive. So clearly we, we know that. So it's going to take individual action, but we have to recognize, and you know, I hear Joanna and, and Paul referring to this, is that this, this is going to take system change. It's not just individual behavior that has to change, although that does have to change, and I fully agree with everybody who has brought that up. But we have to look at the system itself, and we have to look at the issue of consumption, who consumes too much, who consumes too little, how do we even that out a little bit so that everybody has a dignified life. This is not something that Montpelier alone could do, clearly, but some people have talked about Montpelier being a model, or Vermont being a model for the nation, perhaps for the world. How do we address the issue of economic injustice? How do we address the issue of overconsumption? We have a system, an economic system, that requires people to consume in order for it to continue to work. Consumers are 70% of the national economy. We keep being told that. When consumers conserve and don't spend money on various things like uh, dryers, clothes dryers, and things like this, this is a, down, this is a downer for the, the economy. So we live in an ecology that the economy is a part of. Ecological economics has been telling us that for years. When do we put the ecology first put the economy second and the economy serves the ecology, not the other way around. How do we do that on a local level? How do we begin to move in that direction? You were next then. Um, Larry Gilbert from East Montpelier, and if I was the king of Vermont, I would do a couple of things. Um, one, I would close the interstate every Sunday and allow bicyclists to run up and down <laughs> on the interstate. Um, I would also um, try to figure out a way, and maybe it's simply a, an outright ban on the uh, recreational fossil fuel consumption, so snowmobiles, uh, motorboats, uh, uh, those, those kinds of things. Um, 
the jet skis, and yeah, those would all be really positive steps. And then um, figuring out a way to, to um, price uh, fossil fuels in a way that's realistic, because yeah. uh, three three ninety nine for a gallon of gas right now is not does not reflect all the costs that go into it, and whether that's something that can be addressed on a state level. Uh, and obviously, if you make gasoline ten dollars a gallon, and everybody go to New Hampshire to buy it. So, uh, but I, I do think that that the way we price fossil fuels does, is not is not realistic. And then one last one last point is that is that all of the experts tell us that we are going to have additional storms like we had uh, last last month. In fact, more of them and worse of them. And so um, I am not convinced that rebuilding our downtown is really a great idea. Just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. We'll do two more and then transition us. Are we always going to do three more? Or are we just going <laughs> 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 to? Yes, yes, yeah, we got a few. Hi, I'm Juliana Jennings. I live on Main Street, and I'm also a business owner. I own Jay Lincoln on Main Street. Um, I wanted to talk about the carbon footprint idea. When we first moved here 15 years ago, on one of the first days of school, my little daughter Ruby came home and had five questionnaires for everyone in the family, including mm -hmm. yourself about their carbon footprint. So I understand from my good friend at the table that it's not an easy thing to, to do to equate because of the different types. But if we did come up with something using perhaps our incredible young minds from high school, some sort of questionnaire, it could get more people involved in making a model and I think Montpelier would be an amazing model for this, for this idea. I'm originally from Houston, Texas, and I'm continually surprised by how you can actually make a difference here. Mm -hmm. I remember my first time here, I saw Bernie Sanders and Ann coming in a parade. And I was like, what are they doing here? You know, I've, ne I've never seen a government official. I've never been in a state house. Mm -hmm. To go in Austin, you have to get patted down. This is. 25 years ago. So I think the carbon footprint idea is a great idea just to get every single person aware of what happens when you take an airplane, how much carbon, do you, you know, those kind of numbers I think are important. And as for your idea about holding, you know, fossil fuel corporations accountable, I, I think that is an excellent idea. And I think that there's a, I know three lawyers right now that would love to do that. <laughs> sure. And yeah, it's a big thing, but do it anyway. Look at the kids in Montana. Do it anyway. Let Montpelier be the first to, to have a lawsuit against, we'll do the research and find who's the biggest abuser. I don't know. I think there's seven in the United States that are the biggest, that have the most emissions. So I, I think that's a great idea. Just let's, if someone with a lawsuit, why not? Look what's happening to our town, you know? And I don't oh, think oh, rebuilding is the best idea. We are rebuilding because I think the town needs it. But we're rebuilding with glue down vinyl that's flood resistant. Like we've been very thoughtful about how we're putting it back together. So that's, that's what I think. And I was wondering from, Mr. Lundra, are these are these heating units you're getting? Are they going to be on the first floor? How does that work for the city? The the, 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 the heating units when you replace the controls, are you going to them? they they have to be on the piping, which is all in the basement. So the, the district heat heat units will be back in the basement, unfortunately. And that means there's no way they can heat it It's anything's possible, but it's it's a very large repiping for each and every building to, mm -hmm. to put those up on the first floor. Okay. There are some some portions of district heating that are connected only by wires, and those are more easily and will be located. It could be more work. What's that? It could be more work. They're, they're very difficult to water. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, All right, we've got two more um, comments, and then we're transitioning to prioritization. Okay, I know we're short on time, so I'll make this concise. I want to, um, can you remind me your name? 
Yeah. Nancy. Nancy, I want to um, repeat Nancy's idea. Just anything to do with the transportation se sector, for one, making our downtown as friendly to bikers, walkers, electric vehicles as possible. So charging stations and also, you know, repainting the roads in a more um, pedestrian friendly way and even heard a lot of people float the idea of making roads maybe not openly hostile to gas cars but not encouraging gas cars on roads um, and also just exp expanding public transportation and making it as reliable and even just functional as possible in Montpelier and all around the state because as someone whose parents have both tried to use public transportation to and from work it's not a viable option, really, at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, I think as you were just saying, um, public transportation, I think the train, like if you go to the train station, there's the one train that carries people, and that, which doesn't go through town, and then there's the other train for the cargo train, which goes directly through town. And I think that if there was some way they could make a train that fit that track, but to carry people, then it could be a really good way to like get right into the middle of town and then just have a stop there and you would be like right there. So I think that trains is something that people should consider. Okay. okay, Carl, big ask of you. How easy would it be to just quickly hit, not the details, but just run through the ideas we've heard just to refresh our minds and then I'm gonna ask people to <coughs> Name what's jumping out to you is again our assignment is one to three priorities. I think we could do some one thing and get some ideas packaged together because there's a lot of really good ones. But um, is be, that it'll, it'll is take it a few minutes, minutes, but I can do it. Is it meant to be long and short term? The priorities that would ideally, if we've got some immediate things that we think we could jump on or we could just assign to the city to look into, we could have some ideas in that bucket and then some. I mean, we've got some state policy ideas. I think we could lump some of that, what we might want to advocate for as a community, and then some things the city could be doing. So, Lauren, it's a big topic, so we can. <laughs> I just wanted to ask if, while Carl sorted through that, if I can put something on the table that I think connects a couple of ideas that might be. Is that more when we get to prioritization? I'm, I'm not going to. I think it's a good thing. I'm ready to go. Oh, you're ready to go. Okay. Yeah. But bring that idea when we get to. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Topic. So I'm just going to go through just, and yeah, pull out the summary. concrete ideas yes. and leave out the question. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, for example, um, <laughs> carbon footprint calculators. Can we get everyone on board to use a common one and use it for a pledge to reduce uh, individual carbon use and calculate how much the town as a whole is producing? Um, use the current downtown for river flow and move the business district up to the VCFA campus. Uh, get rid of lawns and uh, other surfaces that don't absorb water well and plant things that soak up, soak up the rain. Use paint to make the streets safer for bicyclists. Uh, stop talking about climate change. Um, make the fossil fuel industry pay through legislation. Uh, get rid of your clothes dryer, don't buy a clothes dryer, uh, dry your clothes on the line. Don't use your clothes dryer if you have one. Get the high school to go to net zero. Thank you. It's cool. Make all the city buildings net zero or about 50% of the way there. carbon footprint calculators, make incentive for electric cars, especially if shared with neighbors, more charging stations for electric cars in Montpelier. Um, there's talk about district heating and making that more available to people versus uh, making uh, electric heat available to people or incentivized for people and getting the electric heat equipment up on the first floor. Look for inspiration in other places. Other cities are doing a better job than we are, including random places across the pond. <clears throat> Possible climate emergency declaration. Figure out how to include uh, con addressing consumption, especially overconsumption and economic injustice. Closing down the interstate every Sunday and letting bikes ride on the interstate. 
um, shut down automobiles and, and other recreational vehicles that use fossil fuels. Yeah, that's the question. Yeah. Um, so, what about the uh, fossil fuel fuel cell stations? Looking for new ones here. Having a train that carries people comes downtown. I think that's that's about it. Did I miss any major concrete idea? I, I'm not sure. I just want to make one correction. You had said that Joseph said stop talking about climate change. He actually said change use something. different language. Change yes. Language. <laughs> yes, thank you. Very good. Yes. Very good. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Okay, so we've gotten refreshed. Um, Let's do it all. <laughs> exactly. Right. A lot of good ideas here. Um, does anybody want to make a proposal like is anything jumping out to you as a couple priorities or Jared you had an idea of lumping something well I, I just wanted to get something on the table okay. it may be part of this list but I'm, I'm thinking about examples in other cities mm -hmm. what they've done and it goes back to a little bit what you were talking about Larry in terms of so one of the things that's that's that a city can do of course you know it, the, the state then would need to allow it to happen but is to set requirements around what type of equipment can be purchased and installed. So in uh, some cities, they are phasing out the installation of new fossil uh, equipment or fossil dependent heating equipment or others. So that, that could be one approach. The other approach that is actually up in Burlington um, is they basically, for any new construction, and I believe it's also go, going to apply to kind of renovations or putting in a, um, a replacement heating system. Um, they will allow you to put in a fossil heating system, but what you have to do is calculate the estimated lifetime uh, co social cost of carbon, and they assign you that carbon impact fee up front, which makes it so that the, the economics of putting in a fossil system are not as attractive as moving to a renewable highly efficient uh, or electric system. That's so, cool. yeah, Burlington's doing that. So those are a couple of examples of like, locally, if we were serious at getting at fossil fuel use, um, there could be regulations around um, whether it's new construction, renovations, phasing out uh, the installation of fossil equipment. And then there's this other alternative model, which is not strictly phasing it out, but at least making it pay for the carbon impact of its use. I, I propose that we come up with a number such as 10 perfectly good ideas. We've got 10 great ideas here. If you want to run them down, we just ran through them, though. Um, we'll the 10th one we just heard, which is to ban carbon installations and utilities to work, pay a fee. It's a great one, too. Um, I think the idea of declaring a car, a, a Montpelier declares a climate emergency caused by a climate disaster would be sudden. Um, promotion of, of non-carbon using things from everything from painting the uh, lines on the highway to uh, promoting bicycles to uh, promoting uh, installing electric charging stations, et cetera, to promote the use of non-carbon using. Can I just say a quick thing about that? I, I feel like there's an equity issue here where not everyone can ride a bicycle, so that needs to be very closely connected to some other form of very simple downtown transportation. I understand that bicycles are not a universal transfer. I just, mm -hmm. just one of the Yeah, I just, I just realized yeah, I haven't really been addressed. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, we are, the idea of, uh, of uh, having a fossil, uh, the idea of a fossil footprint mechanism creating, demanding that we have a fossil footprint mechanism that we, can, that we can determine where we are. We make this not just simply an action for my picture, but it's also a national and international set of actions we're setting up here. It was the first one we came up with. It. We have 10 of here. We've got 10 good ideas to suggest we take those steps. <laughs> So I'm, I'm trying to get down your 10 ideas, and I have about four of them. Oh, OK. I, I'm sorry. I was, you had one down. You were yeah. down yourself. So, uh -huh. just so you're, you're, you're just saying, saying all of the above? Yeah. Is that right? Yes. It's pretty much all of the above. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, uh, <laughs> I, I did not include moving downtown. Um. Okay, I'm trying to do some lumping for us. So, it feels like there were a few um, 
state policy idea, so I just want to get a sense of the room. So if we, um, would we like to prioritize the Make Big Oil Pay campaign as something that would be on our city policy priorities and that we would try to get community engagement in telling that story? If this, is, if this would be in your top three things um, to bring up to the room, raise your hand. Okay. Um, how many times you get the vote? Three. It was in your top three, so you get three votes here. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I think should be okay. Go through them all. So we yeah, I was going to say three. people are voting before they've heard your groupings here. There's yeah, they're very different kinds of ideas. So. Well, you know, more what I'm what I'm thinking. Yeah. I, I couldn't vote for that because I am. Um, if we were going to do some kind of suit like that, without having some kind of every individual Montpelier who's hyped up now about doing something, some way for them to yeah. try to get an idea of how they can fill their dryer or save carbon. If we were going to work on that and then maybe go for something big, yeah. I could do that. But if we're just going to go for that and there was nothing happening for individual citizens to kind of like feel like we're part of this, we're helping Montpelier, then I couldn't do that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I hear you. Um, yeah, and we're we're I mean, we have so many good ideas. So we're bringing we're gonna you know break the rules a little and break more than. <laughs> so, 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 so. <laughs> there's there's even more than ten though. So yeah, this is where we need to work a little. I think there's three that I would characterize okay. as sort of low hanging fruit in the short term. Okay. Can we do it very quickly? And one would be to create some kind of a common carbon cal carbon footprint calculator and try to. Bring it into, into use, create a, a resolution as Joanna suggested, and um, change the language that we're using uh, around this topic. Those are things that I think are, could be done pretty quickly and, and fairly easily. These other things, great ideas, all of them, but just require a look. I don't know when you say short term, are we talking get something you know going next week? Are we in 2024 or what? You know, so that's 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 a, a concern. So. So well, why don't we, we can go th through, I mean, I captured um, pretty succinct, but it's like t more like 20 ideas than I got from Carl's list. So, I mean, it sounds like people just feel like we just need to go through and vote. So do your top three, we'll capture it. And if it ends up being that 14 are, you know, the will of the room, then <laughs> that's, that's what we can do. But um, so top three, and I think like I, I, all of these ideas are being captured, and so I do see like opportunity that we could bring more of these to um, you know a process. Like some of these ideas could go into a climate emergency. They could be, go to the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. So even if we lose some from our top list, these ideas are all being captured, and, <laughs> and I think there are a ton of great ones. Okay, so some kind of um, so you get three votes only. Uh, community carbon footprint. When we get five, since we're going to more than three. Because I think everything's going to make the list then. <laughs> you get you get three. They've asked us in the report back. They've asked us in the report back to identify one or one, 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 one. Already really good the rules, and but this, this is so too hard. So carbon footprints. You're okay. For a, uh, All right. Yeah. We're going to go four. You get four. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Four votes, people. Okay. Community carbon footprint. Some kind of way that we can have a community assessment. Okay. Okay. A uh, moving the business district. I'm just saying this idea has come up in the other sessions as yeah. well. Okay. Um, more sustainable lawns and like water absorption, getting into that. Okay. Uh, making our streets more bike pad friendly, accessible with paint and other immediate things. The transportation bucket. I know, the transportation, transportation bucket with public transit. Nancy, do you take Miriam's as a friendly amendment to yours? Sure. The whole okay. okay. Okay, so we we'll love transportation as a core focus that would be looking at more bike ped. Yeah. And, well, and public transit. Non fossil fuel. Non -fossil fuel. fuel. And charging. Okay, we're going to put that into a bucket. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so that's getting a lot of 13. 13. 13. Okay, so, and I'm going to add to that, so we're not going to vote separately on. Um, 
like chargers. I mean, I think yeah. we should look at the infrastructure, the non-carbon yeah. infrastructure, public transit, trains. Well, lump, uh, the city should look into these. Okay, great. Um, can I ask a, before I go further? Can I yes. ask Jared one question about electrification? <laughs> what what um, percentage of New England's grid relies on natural gas for electric, generating electricity? How much of our electricity comes from natural gas generation? So it's a complicated question because Vermont has its own electricity purchases, which are about 5% of New England's grid. So we can look at it at New England or we can look at it in terms of Vermont's purchases. Region-wide, uh, it's about 50% of our electric grid is fossil gas. Um, in Vermont, less than 10% of our electricity portfolio is fossil, gas, is fossil fuel. So we're about 90% carbon free in terms of Vermont's electricity portfolio. Okay. Um, communications as a focus for the city to do to dig into how we talk about this crisis in more compelling ways and engage people. So I think that was changing the language, right? I yeah. Think it was changing the language, but all, if, if you're talking about what I said, it's um, about educating people, informing people of what they do. That was my. Point. Okay. Well, I was combined, kind of combined. Yeah. No, I'm not, I'm, yeah. So. I so. If this includes declaring a climate emergency, that's a separate one. That's a separate one. Yeah. Well, I was in my proposal of declaring a climate emergency. It, it was. Yeah. Uh, because, because using because, a better language. Because because it's <laughs> talking about it as fossil fuel disasters okay. and education. Education. Okay. So this is an education campaign declaring climate emergency. Okay. Yeah, it's an organizing tool, man. All right. So let's vote for climate emergency as a communications and organizing tool. With so many of your good ideas. Uh, yes, we are lumping with great ideas. Um, looking into ways that we can address overconsumption, which might include things like killing dryers. I already voted. I kind of, I thought I could kind of put the killing dryer in the, uh, when you're kind of doing your car that's part of it. Like, so that could be, part of it. I can be a sub campaign under okay. recycled t shirts with kill your dryer. Okay. Uh, I'll just let you know if there's anything that hasn't been lumped. Um, okay, we need to do the fossil, like the yeah. heating system. So, yeah. fossil heating, transitioning. We're this close. We're this close. Yeah, everyone's gathering upstairs. So okay. <laughs> okay. So, no, we no, need four votes. Four votes, four votes. No fossil fuel heating, which we would look into. Do we want to do a ban? Do we want to do oh, like um, incentives? Like the Berlin. Like looking at models. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're Can we know efficiency of that? Well, we never talked about efficiency. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Friendly moment. I think that was 13. Yeah, 13. Okay. okay. All right. I'm trying to think if there's anything that hasn't gotten lumped already. Maybe the three that we're looking for a sister city that's, uh, that's uh, done a climate emergency. <laughs> Let's look at that. District T, do we want like a separate thing or lump that in with that? No, 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 no. Okay. All right, I think we've captured. Thanks, I'll do some magic to try to report out. But this was awesome. How many do we have? Okay, so well, the things I got a lot of thing was um, some kind of community carbon footprint. Um, so some kind of project to look at how do we incentivize each other. Um, there was a whole transportation that included looking at making, you know, like pedestrian, accessible, public transit. Um, there is uh, looking at no new fossil fuel heating systems, so a range of ideas. There's declaring a climate emergency. Um, and as part of that, I think we're going to look at some of the policy ideas, like we think Big oil should pay. We think so. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some more. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Those are big ones that have a bunch of my stuff. I guess. Fossil fuel industry accountable is different. That's right. Yeah. So that's that could be part of our emergency. Is that we 